All right. Hello and welcome. My name is Martha Alter Hines. <clears throat> and I have the pleasure again to welcome all of you to what is going to be a third soul wisdom gathering with a beautiful group of beings. And um, so today, who we have here physically on the call is Don Brunke, Mara McBratney, Julia Balaz, Heather Ensworth, Anne Baring, Melanie Reinhardt, and myself. And um, in the previous two videos, you have seen also Kelly Hunter. And I, so I want to presence that Kelly is really here in spirit. Uh, and she wanted me to let you all know that if you listen to the last recording, um, her sister recently passed. So she is actually on her way to the service, to the memorial of her sister. And um, so I wanted to acknowledge that. I wanted to acknowledge that she's still here as part of this circle, that we're all including her and also sending her love as she navigates her sister's passing. So, um, and then similarly, again, if you've heard the other two videos, what I said at the beginning, I'm going to say again, which is this circle is meant to be a holding space and a microcosm of the sacred circle that we are all in together and that you are part of. So I would really love to invite you today to be present and to bring yourself fully into this sacred space in whatever way feels just right for you. And to know that we are holding your voice and your presence just equally as important as our own. And we feel you here and we include you here. So, um, so welcome. And thank you so much for being here. And today, <clears throat> Maura is going to be facilitating. So again, if you've seen the other two videos, what you've seen us talk about is that in each of these gatherings, we're going to be taking turns facilitating. So the first... In the first gathering, Heather facilitated, the second one, Julia facilitated, and in this third one, Mora is facilitating. And each time we do this, very consciously, we are holding space in a way that each person's facilitation is unique to them. Because again, this is very reflective of every single one of us having a particular soul song or a soul signature, right? The particular gifts and a particular way. So there's no one right way to be a sacred being of this planet. Um, and so we're trying to mirror that in the way that we're holding space in this circle. So, and then the very last thing we'll say is actually our theme today is living as a divine human. And um, yeah, so welcome. And thank you, Maura, for taking thank you <laughs> yeah say so, good morning everyone so uh, first i'm going to lead us in a meditation to kind of ground and create the container so if everyone would just uh, presence themselves where they are close their eyes i'm not going to call in the medicine wheel the symbol of wholeness of the earth and the container we'll be working in today so that we, in our circle. And I call in the energies, the power, the wisdom of the South, the path of alignment, the way of the teacher whose guardian is fire mother. She who ignites, tempers, and burns away the dross to what's essential so that we may be who and what we are in alignment with who and what we are, embodied souls. And we move to the West and I call on the energy, the power, the wisdom of the West, the path of relationship, the way of the healer, whose guardian is water mother. She who teaches us flow and fluidity, who wears away the hard edges with her presence who seeks her own level, who cleanses, heals, restores, and renews us so that we, we may dwell in conscious love. And we move to the north 
We call in the energy, the power, the wisdom of the North, the path of consciousness, the way of the warrior, whose guardian is Earth Mother. She who teaches us to ground and helps us create our own container so that we may acknowledge, accept, have compassion for, and love all the different parts of our consciousness and hold them to allow the life force energy to come forward, our sacred sexuality. And we move to the East and we call in the energy, the power, the wisdom of the East. The path of integration, the way of the visionary whose guardian is wind mother. She who blows out everything that's no longer needed and brings in the new. Who supports the eagle in his flight with his 360 degree vision. Who gives us the breath of life. Breathing in, we take in nourishment and what we need to sustain. Breathing out, we let go of what no longer serves and release it back to the cosmos. And we walk gently to the south again and then move directly into the center of the medicine wheel. And standing there, presencing ourselves, we know we are the conduit between heaven and earth. We allow that energy to, from our body to go down through our legs, into our feet, feeling the ground, the earth be below us, and grow roots going down through the different layers of the earth, the dirt, the lava, the fiery center. Down to the center we go, all the way, taking our energy down to the the center to the heart of our mother. And we meet her there and she blesses us and nourishes us and provides her energy so that we can sustain in this plane. And we take that energy back up through the roots all the way into our feet, into our legs, into our torso. And we allow it to wash our nervous system, our musculature, our bones, permeating every cell of our body, allowing us to, to vibrate at the level of the earth, the frequency that the earth brings. And then we move to the crown chakra and we open our crown chakra and know that we are of the heavens also of the cosmos. And our energy goes out seeking where we belong, where we came from, who we are in that realm, what star, what planet or planets draws, what deep space resonates with us. And we bring that energy down through the crown chakra. And as it comes in, it comes in as a column of light to our center, illuminating and spreading out to the cells to coexist with the earth energy. And then it expands out more on all the different subtle layers and levels of our being beyond the body, holding us, nourishing us, allowing the light to filter through all of our essence. And as we feel that and know that resonance, we come back to our heart center. And there, heaven, the energies from heaven and earth coalesce and coexist and allow us to be centered in our heart, to be able to be present and in ourselves and in this world and connected to all the other realms. 
And from this place of heart-centeredness, we presence ourselves in the room again. Slowly open our eyes when we're ready and join the circle again. Hmm. We're going to take a big breath. Okay. So our theme today, as Martha said, is living as divine human, which is kind of the crux of the whole issue of being here, right? So um, I'm going to start by calling on different people to um, give us their take on that and to share with you what they what comes through for them. So Anne, I'd like to start with you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> That's very nice to start. A beautiful, beautiful introduction you've given. Thank you so much. Well, I have been writing chapters of my book on the Essenes and the Gnostics, mm -hmm. and they both understood that we were divine beings having a human experience, but they said that we'd forgotten generally, the mass of humanity had forgotten where we have come from that we are divine beings and have really lost the connecting thread that could um, bring us to into our true consciousness, our true nature, our, our starry nature, which is we come from the stars. We don't know where we come from the Pleiades, from Sirius, from um, Arcturus, we can't really say, but certainly some starry beings we come from. We are, we are starry beings. And it was Parmenides who said, the great pre-Socratic philosopher who said, we are divine beings having a human experience. And Teilhard de Chardin says something very similar too. So this has been known for a very long time, but it's been forgotten for 2,000 years, except by the alchemists who did know and by those who kept alive the feminine principle, which is, of course, the principle of relationship, the principle that connects us to our starry source and also to the earth, that was unfortunately lost in the, during these 2,000 years, except by very few initiates who kept it going. So I think that it's something that's terribly important for the whole of humanity to know this discovery or this insight that was known. It was known by the Pythagoreans. It was known by the Orphic mysteries, mist, um, mystes, as we're called, the mystics of the Orpheus tradition. That was passed to Pythagoras, and then he in turn passed it down to the um, Essenes and to the, to the other groups. And the most extraordinary picture is emerging of a huge area that had many people teaching these mysteries that were all wiped out, I regret to say, by um, the Christian church, who could not tolerate any um, opposition to what it was teaching. And yet it should have included this whole visionary experience of the Gnostics and the Essenes, but it couldn't tolerate it. So it eradicated it with the help of two emperors, Constantine and Theodosius I in the fourth century. And by the fifth century, there was really very little left. There was a wonderful teacher called Hypatia in Alexandria, who was a Neoplatonist and who knew about all this teaching and was teaching that. And she was unfortunately murdered, I've just been writing about this, by a Christian mob in the most terrible way. And I put her into my chapter because she mustn't be forgotten. So this is, I've been deep, deeply steeped in this understanding and hoping that even the tiny bit that we're doing, we could bring this understanding to humanity so that everyone could know that they are divine beings having a human experience and that they will return to the light at the end of their life. They will be received back into the source, so to speak. They will know more fully than we can know perhaps in incarnation who they are, where they've come from, and what their purpose is. 
So I think that's all I need to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. That was so beautiful and grounding it in the history of what we've lost is so important for us to know this is not new. You know, this is this is us. This is who we really are. Yeah. Thank you. Melanie. That very same phrase also came to me and like the one you've just been talking about it was there kind of all day long for me. But I'll just say that um, I think the first time I heard that notion put in a really concise sentence was in the teachings of Ram Das. So back in the day, in my youth, he was definitely one of the most significant teachers of all. He was amazing and still is, actually. But when he, when he said the sentence, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. He followed that up. Now, this I heard I heard him say this and I can't remember now if it was on a recording but it or whether um I heard it actually live um in his presence but in his inimitable and sometimes very humorous way he describes as I recall that he was perplexed to some degree by this and wanted to discuss it with his own teacher. And the discussion resulted in the insight that Ramdas says, oh, well, I guess I better take the curriculum, <laughs> which I loved. And then I have a short prayer, which I'd like to read. This is from a wonderful new book called The Book of Flashes, written by Elias Amidon. And this is one of the, my favorites so far. I wait for your sign, but you leave no trace. I know you are in the space between things and in the space they take up and in the space I take up, but you leave no trace. You are quiet. You rely upon me to sing. Thank you, Melanie. Thanks, everybody. Heather. Hmm. Thank you all. It's beautiful to hear this weaving that's happening with these different threads. And I'll follow up on that same phrase and core theme. And I just would like to read some notes that came to me today as I pondered on this. So I'll just read that. Being divine humans means remembering that we are soul selves having a human experience. It is not about transcendence, but about embodied spirituality. It means that our path of spiritual initiation is both the path of enlightenment and endarkenment, of illumination and consciousness, and the growth that comes through facing our shadow and going through our underworld journeys and times of transformation. It means honoring being in the mystery and trusting in what is unseen. It means daring to feel all that we feel and be fully present with others who are in pain and suffering and in their own underworld experiences. It means coming into wholeness and trusting that we are held by energies much larger than ourselves. 
It means moving out of disconnection and separation into unity consciousness and our awareness that we are part of the oneness of all that is. We are each fractal expressions of the sea of divine love and cosmic consciousness. So beautiful, thank you. Perfect, very perfect. Dawn. Okay. Wow. Um, so much here, huh? So much. Yeah. All right. I would like to share a dream that I had several months ago that I think really fits this, um, this topic. So in the dream, I'm standing at the bottom of an ocean. And the sand beneath my feet is really soft, really fluffy. And I can feel several hard metallic objects just below the surface. And as I bend down to grasp one, all these flurries of sand rise up all around me, obstructing a clear view. But when I stand, I'm holding the object and I see it's a giant pupil, huh? like an eye pupil. It's a large black disc that's flat on one side and domed on the other. And it reminds me of the flat earth image. And I'm wondering, huh, what's that about? And there's a presence beside me that comments that the flat earth and the spherical earth are two different views, but also the same. So I turn the pupil over. Now I'm looking into it. I'm gazing at this flat surface, but I realize it's concave. And as I look deeper, I see the cosmos, velvety black space, tiny sparkling stars, little planets. And there's also a platform on the side that lets you jump into the cosmos. And the presence then asks, do you want to see or be seen? And I understand this question as a choice. Do you wanna see through the giant pupil as with a divine eye? Or do you wanna step into the cosmos to participate and be seen? And just as I'm waking up, I hear the answer, both, both. So at the time of the dream, I was um, engaged in this ongoing conversation with a very expansive group of beings that I called the Galactic Council. And it was our habit to talk every morning. And so that particular morning, they commented on the dream. And I'd just like to read a little bit of what they had to say here. Your dream speaks to the nature of perception the highs and lows of, of perspective, the ins and outs of references, a flat, concave, or spherical earth to see or be seen. And as your answer indicates, why not all? You found a hard truth, metallic and strong at the bottom of your ocean, your personal and collective unconscious. And as you bring it up, you see it as a pupil, the black hole or the center of an eye that perceives and is also a portal. Our comment on your dream is that it introduces a varied aspect of perception that humanity would be wise to bring up to conscious awareness. A manner of perceiving that allows different views to be seen as simultaneous aspects, facets, or harmonics of a larger whole. As you break free of limiting perspectives, you open to a larger holographic perspective. Your dream is a stepping stone to connecting yourself to your divine or higher self with more conscious awareness. Does this make sense to you? They were forever asking if it made sense to me. <laughs> and I said, yes, it does make sense to me. The dream offers a clue huh, about observing with the big eye of our higher selves with divine knowing, while also living really fully with all of our experiences within this world. So the answer of both is to be aware of who we are both as earth humans and as expansive spirit selves, huh? You know, in alignment with cosmic consciousness. <clears throat> and they said, yes, this dream speaks to the nature of synchronous perception, which at a very expanded level is the perception of all that is. So a lot of what I had been exploring with this group was this notion of the synchronous realm, 
You know, it's not just those, not only those fun synchronicities in life huh, that happen occasionally, but rather an actual state of being in which we are expanded, sensing ourselves as connected to everything, very aware of those rich, abundant, creative connections that are all around us all the time. And they commented, <clears throat> there is an expanding fluidity of consciousness that occurs as you open to the synchronous. What formerly seemed separate or unconnected is now viewed with tendrils of connection, sometimes humorous, sometimes magical, sometimes allowing for great strides of awakening. As humanity continues to evolve and awaken, there will be many more such experiences available. These experiences help to shift your energy, your frequency, your thoughts, your feelings, even your cellular makeup. As you open to the synchronous realm, you realize all is flowing and all is connected. And this is where humanity shifts and evolves within the frequent frequencies of the synchronous. It is a coherence realm that allows integration and can help attune you to greater truths about yourself and the nature of reality. So how does that connect with our theme, living as divine humans? You know, I think living more consciously in the synchronous is a stepping stone, um, a way for us to both see and be seen, to anchor ourselves in a way that allows us to follow our passions and creativity and live a meaningful life. And at the same time, allows us a larger, clearer view, one that senses the divine flow and wisdom, you know, behind all the scenes of what we perceive as ordinary reality. And just one note before I end here, I'd also like to come back to that point in the dream where my dream self feels something beneath the surface. Huh? And in the process of bringing it up causes this flurry of sand particles to rise up and obstruct the view. And it occurs to me that's a really good metaphor of where we are collectively right now. You know, we're waking up, we're sensing forgotten truths and ways of beings that are buried beneath the surface. But it's a process, yeah? <laughs> you know, bringing up this deep knowledge, integrating this into a more expanded sense of self. And I think things can often seem very fuzzy. We may have obstructed views. Um, and maybe that's where we'll be for a little bit of a while, huh? In between clarity and confusion, learning to balance what we have forgotten with what we already know. So for me, this dream really felt like an invitation to step into a larger form of knowing. And I share that as an invitation to all of us, huh? To be more aware of the intrinsic connection between our human selves and our divine selves. And I think the encouragement, not only from this dream, but from so many helpers and guides, is to trust the process that's unfolding, to follow our curiosity, to trust our intuition, to do the work, to do the shadow work, and to connect with those many aspects of who we really are in more awakened and conscious ways, to live as divine humans. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Don. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Julia. Thank you. So wonderful to be here. My contribution today aligned with the theme is radiant love. How can we embody radiant love? Because to me, it represents embodiment of being divine human. And I want to share the experience I had when I was practicing what I was teaching in one of my earliest courses, Your Higher Self Connection. There is a lesson on different breathing techniques and to become aware of different states of consciousness and how we can um, consciously, through breathing techniques, um, experience uh, either theta or gamma brainwave state that makes it much easier for us to feel connected to all that is and have that kind of quantum perspective of past, present, and future all at the same time. And in one intense practice, what I've experienced was sensation of an identity coming from stars shooting into my body and arriving and being like, oh, I made it. I cannot believe I actually made it. And the identity was love. And for maybe, I don't know how long it took the experience, but I was 
nothing but radiant love and everything else seemed almost ridiculous and I even felt very strongly about I should be called I, I should be um, known as love I should change my name my surname didn't make sense and then I thought everyone should actually be called love and change their surnames to love because it's obvious that we are love and then in that I started reflecting about the modality that I was practicing at the time quantum healing hypnosis technique and to that identity love it felt like um, arbitrary to for people to come and be led through different techniques because it's so much more simpler than that. It's, you know, once they realize they are love, all their problems will fall away. Um, so I was thinking about how I will communicate that to all my subscribers and all booked clients. I imagine I just open their, my door and give them a massive big hug and I'll feel, surely feel this radiant frequency of love that just makes everything cl crystal clear and healed and perfect. Uh, it was a very interesting experience to have, to be so certain of knowing yourself as love. And uh, there was joy, there was humor. Um, it was wonderful. So I realized with that how complicated we like to make things with our mind when we when we are more embodied in the mind body. <laughs> That's the right way to say it everything becomes more complicated and twisted and turned. And it's very entertaining, uh, addictive even to go down all those many paths, but um, it can become overwhelming and confusing and then hurting even on a physical level because it's not natural. I feel the most natural state of being for us is being radiant love. So how can we self-regulate to keep returning to that state every time we experience something that is in contrast to that? So the reason I wear this um, uh, top today was because I stepped out of being radiant love for a moment that triggered a contrast. And it was my daughter who wanted to take a dog for a walk and wanted to listen to music. And I said, you can't because it's not safe because you need to hear the cars. And anyway, when you are quiet, it's the most important time of your day because that's the time when your higher self speaks to you. And her reaction was like, oh, come on. <laughs> you know, I don't want to hear any of these uh, preachings. I just want to hear my music. And I was taken aback how much it triggered me. And I had to self-regulate and it took me a while and I, it took time to, I had to stretch my body and move the energy that was very strongly present, frustration and, you know, all the thoughts that came with it. I had to go for a walk and the space cleared and I started slowly returning to being radiant love, realizing how important it is to, to get out and feel nature and let the sun shine on you and how helpful and soothing it is in that self-regulating process. And then it had to be a shower and had to wear a color of love to then suddenly return to the natural state. And I believe it was a process that was, that'll hopefully be helpful for, for the viewers to be hyper aware of those, uh, of your own self-regulating practices and um, helping you remember and return to being radiant love. And to come back to what Anne was saying, and actually every single one of you here through the QHHT practice as I was regressing clients to recall either their past lives or to regress to state of being where they find answers to their questions. The most wonderful experiences for me to witness was when people spontaneously regress to a moment when they wear radiant love as a sphere in other star system in a more ethereal state of being, and they heard the call from Mother Earth for support. Just like in any community, when a person is going through transformation, everyone is ushered to support that process, to hold space for that being. And I believe we were ushered here from all walks of this galaxy and beyond to hold space for Mother Earth. And many of these clients who regress to that state, they felt so relaxed and so at peace and like everything was falling away. So much weight was falling away from their being by realizing that they are radiant love and they came here to anchor radiant love to support planet in her ascension process. So may we remember 
the radiant love and embody it as best as we can. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, yes, yes. Martha. Thank you, Julia. I really actually needed to hear all of that just then. That that was made a shift in me, and I'll explain why in a second. But I also want to say our daughters are about the same age, and I'm just laughing because my daughter has just started taking walks and listening on AirPods to Taylor Swift. Like that's like and that's the thing she wants to do. It's hilarious. Um, yeah. So, but but the so the spirit world is asking me essentially to share two two related things. And this, this is, this will get into why I needed to hear what you had to say, Julia, there. Um, so the first part is that last week, my little teeny tiny cat, adorable cat died very unexpectedly. And, um, and I, it's the first time I've ever experienced having to make the decision whether to have a cat euthanized or an, or an animal euthanized. And I made that decision and I've been, it was extremely traumatizing, extremely difficult, very upsetting. And there's, uh, I've come a long way since a week ago, but, but there's still in my heart, in my body today, this guilt that's like having a really hard time unhooking. And Julia, just now when you were talking about being radiant love and that being the only real truth that came into my being and it, and the guilt unhooked. It's like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I truly is actual medicine for me. So, um, I'm gonna guess that's how other people are gonna be feeling in response to that in their own ways. But so, thank you for that. And and then, so what I'm being asked to share is <clears throat> two things. So, with regard to the whole theme of living as defined humans, um, in my own praying normally every day I go into I get taken out of the time space continuum and I get shown the perspective of the light or the divine or that kind of a thing so so typically when I have something difficult going on in my life virtually always even if it's something very difficult I when I go into my praying when I get taken into that place I will be shown some kind of perspective where the difficult feelings in my body or whatever it is can unhook and I can feel, I suddenly feel so much better. Even if, again, even if it's something very, very hard, but last week when my, when my cat was dying and then when she had died, I couldn't, I couldn't feel better. It wasn't working. And, and what I was actually told when I went into my praying was don't try to transcend this. So it was very similar to what you're saying, Heather, you know, that, that living as defined human is not about only transcending it's actually about coming down and in and up all at this like being the wholeness of everything and actually what they also said to me that they wanted me to say out loud is in my case but i think maybe true for just us in general is they said actually it's not responsible for you as a conduit of the divine to try to transcend this that would actually be irresponsible of you don't do it <laughs> so so they're adamant you know basically i needed to feel the pain i needed to feel the sadness and the grief and the guilt and the all the things i was feeling so i had a, a two three days when i was pretty much not functional i mean functional enough i could take care of my kids i got them their dinner <laughs> drew, drove them where they needed all those things but it was it was not fun um and then, and then I think on Sunday I was praying and I, I felt a shift. And so I felt like, oh, okay, I think finally maybe something else can come in. And so I asked, I opened to that. And what I, then what I had come in was this, what looked like an Egyptian cat being came and sat or stood next to me. And, and it, <clears throat> Um, I've never had a being like that come to me and the being put one hand or one paw on my heart and then the other one on my lower abdomen. And at first it said, you know, it's really okay. It's all okay. 
And then the other part it wanted me to share, they wanted me to share with you today. They said, and remember, we're all in this together. We're all doing this. It's not just humans trying to fix the world or whatever it is. It's not, that's, that's actually still in the mind of separation. That's not correct. <laughs> we're doing this all together, which I think again, connects to what so many of you have been saying. And, um, and so that leads into the the last part of what they wanted me to share, which is I've, I've been given this vision or this image, which maybe a lot of you also have for years of, <clears throat> um, what I've been shown is that our natural way of being as humans, as beings of Gaians, like Jude Carvin says, you know, people of beings of this planet, our natural way of, of being has for eons been to on a regular basis in various ways come into a a continual uh state of communication with the existence of infinity so every realm of existence throughout all of time all of space and beyond every dimension on a regular basis would come into communication uh with everything else continuously and that is how what i get shown is that's how humans would come into the knowledge that we needed in various times and places and moments and and that like in saying that we have forgotten that that's actually our natural way of being and what they've been saying to me recently is do it it's the time do it again so so for me this even this circle is part of that on, on a certain level, I think that's exactly what we're doing here. And we're hopefully um, holding space for all of you listening to do that in your own way. But also what they asked me to do is this solstice, June 21st, I'm going to be holding a, a free gathering. So if it calls to you, please join for that. But what that's going to be um, is called, they're calling it a gathering of the Council of Infinity, which kind of reminds me of what you're discussing, Don, <laughs> also. And and yeah, so I'm going to channel essentially a, a holding space for us to reconnect as beings of divine, beings of earth, beings of humans um, into that, that way of communicating continually in each our own ways and as a collective. And um, yeah, I would love to have you there if that calls to you. But, but the real point being that what I'm being told is it's an imperative. It's actually an imperative that we now reconnect with the reality that we're not doing this alone. We are doing this all, all together on every level. And that it's time now for, for, I think, a lot of us to click back into that knowing and that way of communicating continuously with the realms of everything and and then what? I don't know. And then what? But then, then what? Then we'll do it minute by minute, whatever it is. And yeah, I'm just so honored and so grateful to be doing this with all of you here and all of you listening. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. That was great. Beautiful. Um, before I share, I just want to um, create a little space to say Kelly isn't here to share, but just maybe if we could hold for 30 seconds just to allow her presence to be here. And then and then I'll go ahead and share. So um, just Kelly, we're with you. Thank you, everyone. So um, the sharings have been fantastic and beautiful, and I really appreciate all the wisdom that's coming through everybody. Um, so when I was thinking about this, I thought, well, this has been like 
for me, it's kind of the crux of my existence of trying to how to be here embodied and live. So I thought, well, you must have something you can say. So I remembered what I did is I remembered a, a story of the first time I had a reading, a psychic reading, which is almost 40 years ago. And I was a little skeptical. I was kind of getting into the more esoteric stuff at that point. Spiritual, yes. Esoteric, not so much. And um, so I went to this woman. She didn't know anything about me. And she said, hmm, hmm. Well, what, what it, it looks like you're this little girl who is invited to a party. And everyone thinks you're at the party. But you're not at the party. <laughs> and I had... I knew she was exactly saying the right thing. I was, I had no knowledge of what that really meant, but I knew it was true. And by that time I had had two children, I'd been married, I'd been divorced. It's not like I didn't have life, some life experience. And that set me on a trajectory of trying to figure out what it meant to be embodied. What did it really mean to be in your body? And how did you get there? Or how could you get there? So I started body work, I, you know, and so it's been an ongoing process for me to be present and be in my body as well as being connected to the divine realms. And what's come from that is a feeling of, um, and a lot of it, like like Julia was saying, is, is being learning to be in the heart center learning to be that radiant love, knowing that love is really what we're here to do and be, and what does that mean? And how do we do it? And it's in those moments, like with your daughter, you know, in those moments when, you know, you want to scream instead and you go, wait a minute. And that's when the rubber hits the road. That's what it's been for me. And it's real life experiences of when I can choose to be love or when I know I have to self-regulate again, so I can go back to being loved, but it's always back choosing to come into that radiant love, to being that radiant love, because I believe that is how we meld heaven and earth. I think that is how our bodies become um, one with our souls, is through through the love, and it's in our cellular structure. And as more I've I've studied it for myself or done my own things, and believe me, I've done. You name it, and I've done something about it with the body. And I've had, you know, I've had illness, and that even that illness to me is 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 a way of the soul connecting with you and telling you, okay. And it might not even be that you did any, you know, that you have to correct anything. It might just be you have to endure it. We don't know. We think we know the answers to all these questions, and we don't necessarily. But what, what we can know is to be present in what's happening to develop that presence inside the body, knowing that it is the body and the soul that are partners and that our body, I've, I've, to, for me, I listen to my body more than I do my mind. I listen to what I feel. I, I listen, okay, if she's not liking that, or if I need to do this, I've always am sensing into, and that took a long time to get to that place where I could trust my body instead of going for the mind. But um, I know that it's the only way I can really stay present and develop that and cultivate that presence that's so necessary for what you were saying, Martha, where, you know, we, we keep getting all the information in, into us, I think, as we become a clearer channel in our bodies, in our minds and our souls through whatever work we do, whether it's body work or whether it's the psychic work, you know, psych psychological work or whatever ways we clear our vessel in order to be able to contain that love and to be able to be open to all the different streams that are coming in so that we become that transceiver that we really are where we are we are we are both sending sending messages out and receiving them at the same time and in communion with the different dimensions so i just have one thing i want to read there's a there's a man that um I've followed for years named David Spangler and he, he has a, his work is around in, incarnational spirituality. So he's, you know, got classes and all sorts of stuff. But what I love about David is, is that he, he's so simple at the same time, he's bringing in all these really complex kind of um, 
what pieces of wisdom, I guess. So he said, there's a wisdom and intelligence within our bodies that knows how to connect across dimensional boundaries. One reason this is so is that our bodies share the same sacredness, the same light as everything else in creation. The light and sacredness in our body and the light and sacredness in our souls are the same. Although energetically they are different frequencies, the soul's light is part of the body light, body's light. To touch one is to touch the other. So, embodiment. Thank you. Um, is there anything else that someone wants to add or um, comments or questions or... Anne, yes, please. I was just going to say that was so beautiful, Maura, and so helpful to so thank you that the body has been neglected. Both even the Gnostics neglected the body because yes. they were concentrating more on the soul. It was completely neglected in Christianity, looked down upon, reviled, blamed for everything. So we're really doing a rescue operation in loving the body and loving the little body of your cat, Martha, and grieving that the, the little precious thing that you held and stroked is no longer here. That's the body feeling missing, the, missing it. Yeah. And um, I had that with my own uh, dog and a cat too, so I know the feeling that you went through. But we mustn't forget that the body must be included in this ascension process that we're going through. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Yes, definitely. Agree. Couldn't agree more. Heather, yes. I, I just want to add to that. Thank you, Maura, and thank you, Anne, because I think that is also the reweaving of the wisdom of the sacred feminine with the wisdom of the sacred masculine. And we have to bring those into balance, into harmony, into unity in order to move through this shift that we're in. Right. And I think the path is the path of love. And I just wanted to share this quote from Rumi that I love. Your task is not to seek love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you've built against it. I feel like that so circles back to what you said, Julia, that we, as we clear those blocks and barriers, we are that radiant love that can come through us. And that is the sea of all that is. Agree. Thank you, Heather. Melanie. Um, just following a similar thread, um, what uh, for me, what's also very powerful about a deep connection with the body is that it, the, in it, within the experiences of the body is also where we we learn about impermanence, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and we learn the wise and compassionate ways of relating to that realm where this body that we may have spent a lot of time and energy mm -hmm. getting to know and feeling its sacredness and so on and so forth, it will die. And our, our instincts are programmed to survive. And th th there's no way that that can be excluded because it's too powerful. Right. And so the way the ways of holding space for that and meeting and approaching that experience um, just feel awesome to me. And also because you know, in our recent contemporary Western cultures, the denial of death has caused innumerable distortions distortions in our minds in our medical ways in society in general and that is mercifully changing a lot now um but there's still an enormous taboo mm -hmm. around this and in some marvelous paradoxical way to to me they kind of go together in other words the 
the perception of the infinite or the the unchanging, the eternal, or whatever wonderful words you want to put on it, and the the um, perspectives and perceptions which open that up. At the same time, we live in a body that is mortal. Even though there are aspects of our being which don't die and do go into another realm and all, all kinds of things mm -hmm. are possible with that, but the body does die. And, you know, to deny that is to give rise to all kinds of weirdness and distortions, you know. Absolutely. And so to me, that the notion of being uh, li living as a divine human must include that, because in a way that's the human bit, that we live in a vehicle that's not immortal. Right. And, uh, yeah. That's just what I wanted to bring in there. It's beautiful, Melanie. Thank you. It's so important. So important to, yeah, the recognition of death and the immortal, the the, the mortal part and the the limited part that the body is. I mean, where we are not limited, right? I mean, in in, in spirit, in divine, there's not a lot of limitations really. But yeah, yeah. So we're living that juxtaposition that that of of the two. And, um, you know, that's that's quite a path to walk. <laughs> Absolutely. Not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> which, which is where the love comes in, in a way. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I found that love can ameliorate so many things. Mm. You know, it, it allows the oppositional forces to be present and, 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 and be held in a, in a wholeness in that. Indeed, you know, even even the fright of rec of truly recognizing mortality, mm -hmm. because what whatever heights one has traversed, or glories one has been shown, etc., from the instinctual level of the body, it can still register as a massive fright mm -hmm. when you really get it, right. you know. You might right. know, yeah, I'm going to die. But in, I'm sure many of you have had the experience of maybe having an accident or getting very ill or just suddenly out of nowhere having a, a realization, a recognition. Bang! This vehicle is not immortal. Not immortal. That itself can be a big awakening, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Nani. Anyone else? Martha? I feel like Julia might have also wanted to say something, but. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I miss your hand? Okay, that's fine. I'll that say it and then fine. you go, Julia. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, it, so I was just going to say, I think it's, I'm just noticing in my mind that today as we're meeting, uh, Venus is con exactly conjunct the sun, which I just noting that it's very interesting given the themes we're talking about um but also for me this is so beautiful and so powerful and so helpful even with regard to my own cat experience and just to add that yeah it's so interesting how on the one hand i on that transcendent level have more and more and more and more of a clear sense from the spirit world, even in my own being that, yes, of course, <clears throat> we, um, it's such a limited thing that we are, we happen to be here in an earth body, but then there's so many spirits that aren't right. So it's, it's almost like we're the minority in a sense. So a part of my, me in my brain can rationalize, oh, it's fine. We die and we live and we die and we live, but we're always alive. And I can rationally get it, but then to have the visceral experience of mm -hmm. the pain of the death of something we love or someone we love, um, it's just really interesting how even with that transcendent understanding, the pain is undeniable and actually, as the spirit world was saying to me last week, sometimes necessary to feel and then 
you know, as the hum- divine human to sit here and go, oh, <laughs> this sucks. I would re- much rather just do the transcendent thing. And then the spirit world going, nope, <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's not, not responsible. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah, the grief, I mean, I can speak for my own, the grief and it's, it's its own animal in your body. I mean, it takes you. Mm. And uh, I know when my husband died, Tom died, there was just nothing to even say or do. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know. I didn't know what was next or if there was a next. And I was totally feeling it on all the levels and especially in my body. I felt like part of me had been ripped out. So, um, you know, we are animal, as Mary Oliver says, we need to love our animal bodies let it do what it needs to do. That's very important part of being human. Yeah. Julia. If I may add, I believe when it becomes that physically intense, the experiences, it often is from my experience, observing so many people going through intense um, emotions, they're, they're usually reliving an echo of other incarnations and oftentimes multiple at the same time and i think astrology can be such a wonderful tool to offer clues or validation to that like currently we have asteroid atlantis trining chiron squaring uranus and a lot of people are reliving an echo of unresolved emotions from their last days in atlantis or you know it's been such a long era of that ancient civilization and a lot of that is coming up and interesting martha when you mentioned the 21st of june i found out recently that on that day asteroid atlantis will be exact exact conjunct with asteroid sekhmet and it in ancient egypt this um was uh, known as ancient goddess of um not only war to to protect um through you know what's just um to make sure that justice is uh, served, but also warrior of, uh, also the goddess of the sacred medicine. And I think it's just something really special about that. So perhaps whatever you're going through that feels very, very intensely, if you can reflect on what if I'm also reliving something that happened in other incarnations could be your ancestral uh, emotions that weren't fully expressed because we were holding back so much. So just really allowing the emotions and the energies to move through us um, is perhaps exactly what needs to happen. And we cannot, we shouldn't want to speed it up and needing to convert it, as you said, but allow it. And that's also the radiant love's presence. It just is in acceptance with what is and allowing that presence, compassion, peace do its own magic in its own time. And then the transit passes and suddenly you feel better. Um, So there there is a lot more going on behind the scenes. So Mm -hmm. a lot of love to all of us. Thank you, Julia. Such a good reminder. Such a good reminder. Any other words of wisdom before we close? If I can just add one one other piece. Yeah. Uh, I really want to follow up on this theme to just say that in a phrase that so many of us know, what we resist persists. And that I think a huge piece of the transition that we're in collectively right now is facing past trauma, in this lifetime, other lifetimes, ancestral trauma, facing our fear of death. Mm -hmm. Because when we don't work with that facing of our mortality and of death and of trauma, we actually enact it and keep perpetuating it. And I think that is a crucial piece we're in on the planet right now. And as we can face and feel then, then we honor that energy of Pluto that takes us through the cauldron of death into rebirth, the cauldron of transformation to come into the true gold of who we are. Thank you, Heather. That's really beautiful too. Important. Yes. I feel like we could, we could go on forever and ever, but I just feel like I want to add what Heather is saying. And I'm thinking that this summer um, is when the nodes are going to, Oh, I have 
fireworks behind me. <laughs> wow. All right. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> That's very interesting. <laughs> Uh, okay someone I guess likes what I'm about to say I don't know um no this uh the nodes of the moon in the next two three months are going to be squaring Ixion, Quawar, Pholus and Ceres in Capricorn which <laughs> Heather has talked about I, I definitely talk I'm it's on my mind and I'm for me it's very much about this releasing of the layers of ancestral trauma and coming back into the soul song maybe of existence in a new healed way but but that we have the the, the nodes squaring the nodes of the moon squaring all of that like we have to address it we can't skip it you know does that fit for you heather uh, yeah 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 um Okay, thank you, Martha. Yeah, all all important stuff to it's 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 really helpful for me who's not an astrologer, but to I go, I know there's other energies going on right now because I can feel there's it's not just me only, you know. So this is it's really helpful to get these perspectives to know that there are other energies going on that's buffeting us. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Don. Okay, I just want to add because I haven't added everybody else added. Um, but I just want to I want to pull this back to, um, you know, a lot of what I've been working with it, which is this synchronous realm, which um, really is this understanding that so much of this is happening at the same time, you know, it's, it's, it's the astrological things, it's the ley lines, it's the chakras in our body, and it's all, you know, stacked. And there's this holographic aspect to it that when we tune into that, it's just such an awakening, you know, and everything really does become clear and all those little sand particles, you know, fall down and we see, we feel, we know what is, right? And it is an emanation of, of love, of who we are, of who all that is, is. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's been so um, beautiful, beyond beautiful. And thanks for all, everyone in the circle that's come to join us. I'm going to do um, uh, walk us back out of the medicine wheel, and we're going to go in opposite direction coming back out. So. We'll start in the center. If everyone just gets comfortable, I'm sorry, and close their eyes. Take a breath. So we find ourselves in the center of the medicine wheel and we walk towards the south. And at the south, we know we are divine love, unconditioned and unconditional. And we move to the east. And as a manifestation of divine love, we encounter healing presence. The ability to let go, but no longer serves and be open for regeneration of what we are to become. And we move to the north. Embracing the wisdom of, of um, right, innate harmony. The peace that surpasses all understanding. The calm in the midst of the storm. We move to the West. Embracing compassion. Just really the ability to see self as other and other as self. My clothes walk to the south, walk, step, take a step out of the medicine wheel and turn around and bow to the center, to the medicine wheel, thanking it for being our container during this time. 
and say a prayer by Donna Donahue. May you live this day compassionate of heart, clear in word, gracious in awareness. generous in love. And so it is. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Amazing. Is it amazing? Everyone was amazing. Mm -hmm.